We are going to start today with a pop quiz. Now you remember, and for some of you it's not been as long as it is for others that are in this room, you remember what it was like, you know, the bell would ring, class, it was time for class to start, and when the teacher started with those words, unless you were the teacher's pet, you know, that just gave you a sinking feeling. Class, take out your pencils. We're starting the class today with a quiz, pop quiz. Well, in a very real sense, that is what we're going to do here today. We're going to start off with a pop quiz. And so if you've got a bulletin, be sure and pull your outline out, whether or not you're used to using the outline. I know some, some maybe don't, and while others do. But for the pop quiz, you're going to need that. So pull that out of your bulletin. And what this test is going to help determine is whether or not you're a real Christian. Okay? I mean, this isn't a tongue-in-cheek comment I'm making. This quiz is going to help determine whether or not you're a real Christian. Christian, whether or not you are saved. Let me show you a verse of Scripture before we actually look at the questions. This particular passage is found, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and Paul said this as he was writing this letter to the church in Corinth. He said, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? It's biblical that we test ourselves. And so that's what we're planning to do here today. Here's the irony of the passage that you have in front of you. It's at the very end of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. There's only 13 chapters in 2 Corinthians. This is in the very last chapter. Now, I know when it was originally written, it wasn't written in chapter form, but still the point is still the point. It's at the very end of the letter. After he said all the different things, dealt with all the topics he intended to deal with, at the very end he puts this statement. On top of that, this is the second letter he wrote to the church in Corinth. And so there's another letter that's even longer. Now, Paul's letters normally weren't this long, but 1st and 2nd Corinthians were the longest of his letters. And so he's written two full letters, and at the very end of the second letter, he says this, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith, examine yourselves Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? I think this is Paul's way of saying, I'm not going to take anything for granted here. And you shouldn't either. There's too much at stake. Okay? So it's it's a pretty serious, pretty serious statement being made. Think about it. Think about how much you would hate it. If at the end of your life, and and you were going from this realm to the next realm, you know, which is going to happen for all of us inevitably, but just think about how much you would hate it if at the end of your life you crossed over and then you discovered something was lacking. At that moment, you discover it. And all of a sudden, you realize that you don't have a place reserved for you in heaven. I mean, you think you would have a bad day if if that came to pass? Well, absolutely. So this is such a legitimate verse for us to take seriously. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Christ Jesus is in you unless you fail the test? Yeah, I'm going to let you grade your own papers on this, all right? Here's the pop quiz. Question number one, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Now, you know, the question isn't, you know, I mean, you're putting yes or no, so, you know, the answer is not real complicated, but but the answer isn't just do you believe that such a person existed. The question is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Christ is in his last name. Christ is a word used to, to explain that he's the anointed. He's the Savior, okay? So do you believe that Jesus is the Savior? I mean, that's really what this question is. Okay, so it's yes or no on that. Question number two. When was the last time you helped someone who was needy? 
For some of you, it's fresh on your mind because maybe you just did it at the tail end of the week. Make a note on that. If you know exactly what day, put it down. If it's further back, to the best of your, of your recollection, put it down. When was the last time you helped someone who was needy? Question number three is building on question number two. In what way did you help them? Okay, so I don't want some kind of a general statement like, well, it was a while back. Okay, let's get more specific. In what way did you help them? The last time you helped someone in need. What specifically did you do? You could summarize that with a word. Maybe it'll take a sentence. Question number four. Was that a rare occurrence or is it fairly normal in your life? I know that's a subjective question, but you're the one grading the paper, so subjective questions are legitimate questions. When you helped someone in need, whatever way, in whatever way that was, was that a rare occurrence or was it fairly normal? You know, something fairly frequent in your life. Question number five. Did it involve you going out of your way for them? I mean, was it just throughout the day and your regular activities, just, you know, you didn't miss a beat, the opportunity was just right there, and so you really never had to go out of your way? Or was it something that, yeah, you had to make a little more effort there because you went out of your way? Question six. Did reaching out to them cost you some time and or personal expense? All right, so did it, did it involve money? I mean, maybe not directly cash or something, but I mean, did it cost you something financially? And or did it actually involve a chunk of time, part of a day or more? That's the question. Question seven. Can you see yourself doing something like this again in the near future? Now, of course, if you answered no, you know, I haven't done anything on question two, you're having a hard time with all the rest of these questions, okay? But, but if you've answered yes, here's the question. Can you see yourself doing something like this again in the near future? And then our final question on the quiz is this. If you already have a plan to help someone soon, summarize what it is. Now, your summary may just be simply one word. As long as you, looking at it, know what you're referring to. Maybe you have to put a few words down. But, but if you already have in mind, oh, yeah, I'm going to be doing such and such. You know, and maybe it's this week. Maybe it's at Christmas. What, whatever. You, know, you already have a plan in mind. Write something down there. If you don't, just say, no, no plan. All right, that's your pop quiz. So just kind of briefly looking over it, how'd you do on that? Remember the scripture. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves or do, yourse- do, uh, or do you yourselves not recognize that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. So biblically, we are to test ourselves. Now, about now, I would imagine that there's probably someone that's gathered here in this room that's thinking, wait a minute. Based on the direction of these questions, I mean, especially after you got past question one, you kind of take a little bit of exception of what's being implied with questions two through eight. I mean, perhaps there's someone here, and I totally wouldn't be surprised because... A lot of times when we touch on a topic, you know, I'll get people on the way out, you know, that'll say, raise questions to me or, or even send me an email or something or other. And, you know, and with something like this, I would assume that there's a person or two or more that's here that has a little hesitation right at this moment. They're saying, now, what exactly are you teaching here? Because I, I might have a problem with this because we aren't saved by good works. We aren't saved by helping the needy 
We're not saved on the base of merit. We're not saved on the base of performance. We're not saved on the basis of deeds. We're saved on the basis of faith, based on the grace of God. So this really isn't even biblical. There may be someone here that's thinking along those lines. Well, what I would like to do is I would like to devote the rest of our time helping to explain to you where I'm coming from, because I think this is totally legitimate, what we just did, and I want you to understand why. You know, I feel that way. There is a passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 25. You can feel free to look there. I'm going to summarize the story for you. This is the last third of this chapter, and Jesus is the one telling the story. It's one of his parables. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And he basically tells it like this, that at the end times, the way it's going to be is it's going to be kind of like a shepherd that uh, has um, a bunch of sheep and goats, and he's going to separate them. He's going to put the sheep on his right. He's going to put the goats on his left. And in a similar fashion, the Son of Man, when he comes to sit on his throne, he, all the nations are going to be gathered before him, and he's going to separate the people, and he's going to put some on his right, and he's going to put some on his left. And as Jesus is telling the story, he gives some of the particulars regarding how the determination is being made that people are going to be separated. He says that he's going to be taking and separating people and putting them on the right. They represent the sheep, and he's going to say to them, well done. Enter into your eternal rest, your reward. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you provided me with some clothing. I was sick, and you tended to my needs. I was a stranger, and you came and visited me. I was in prison, and you didn't forget about me. You came by to see me. And these people that are on his ride are going to say, wait a minute, Lord, when did we ever see you naked and provide you with clothing? When did we ever see you hungry and thirsty? When did we ever see you in prison and come and visit you? And then Jesus says that he will say, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And then he will turn to those on his left. And he will say, depart from me into destruction for I was hungry and you did not feed me I was thirsty and you provided me with nothing to drink I was naked you did not give me clothes I was sick you did not tend to my needs I was in prison you didn't even bother to swing by to visit me and they're going to respond and say Lord when when did we see you a stranger and, and invite you in when did we see you in prison and go and visit you when did we see you hungry and thirsty and provide you something to eat and drink and Jesus says it's at that time I'll say whatever you did not do for the least of these you did not do for me it's a really strong passage of scripture this passage as a matter of fact has always intrigued me for over 30 years now and i got to be honest, it's also made me a bit nervous because it's a very strong teaching that Jesus is giving here. It almost comes across like he is promoting a works salvation, like the entire determination as to whether we go to heaven or we go to destruction, we go to hell, is going to be based on our actions. Whether we have helped people or we have ignored people that were needy. And, and, you know, that's kind of challenging when you stop and think about it because there's some pretty clear passages of Scripture as you continue reading in your Bible that seem to say otherwise. you got passages like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift not from works, so that no one can boast. I mean, Paul was making it pretty clear to the church in Ephesus, and he was saying that we are saved by grace through faith. It's not works. You have no reason. When, when you stand in eternity, 
and, and you're having your eternal reward in the presence of God, you will not have the wherewithal to pat yourself on the back because you performed well enough and now you've gotten due payment. You've received your reward for being so good. Paul's saying that's not the way it works. We're saved by grace. Or you look in another passage, and this was a very short book in your New Testament, Titus. It's only three chapters long. But again, this, this uh, is Paul writing this, and he's writing it to a young, younger guy than him, a, a preacher, and he's just kind of doc doctrinally helping him to understand so he'll be better able to teach the people that he leads in the church that he's serving in. And he says this, But when the goodness of God in his love for mankind appeared... He saved us, not by works of righteousness. That's another way of saying, not by works of good deeds that we've done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Regeneration, one of those 50-cent words, it's basically the idea of new birth. Remember, Jesus had said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you'll not enter into the kingdom of God. Well, regeneration is a word that means the same thing as being born again. And so what Jesus is, or what, what Paul is saying here in this passage, when the goodness of God and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by our performance, not by the good deeds that we did, but it's according to his mercy and through the work of the Holy Spirit, the new birth that we experience through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we have a couple passages like that that make it rather clear, it seems like, that we're, we're not saved on the basis of our performance and the good deeds that we do. And so on that, it's really hard to draw a conclusion that says that, well, what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 25 is that we are saved on the basis of whether we visit people that are in prison, on the basis of whether we provide food for, for those who are hungry and clothing for those who don't have clothes. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by being good. And the Bible is pretty clear in other passages too it says that all of our good deeds isaiah said this all of our good deeds are like filthy rags in contrast to god's holiness you know so no matter how much good we seem to be able to muster up on our own it's nothing compared to god you know and so so again then how does our present subject matter factor into all of this how does that passage in 2 Corinthians 13 fit into this? How does that parable that Jesus taught in Matthew 25, how does that fit into all of this? That's what I want to help you to understand. Let's go back to a verse that we looked at last week. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says this. This is how... We have come to know love. Remember last week, a lot of what I talked about was explaining that the word we were looking at was the word agape. There's different kinds of words that are used in Greek to talk about uh, different aspects of what we use our one word love in, to be in reference to. This is the word agape. It's not philia. It's not eros. It's, not, it's agape, which the word agape basically is a sacrificial kind of love. It's God's style of love. It is not a love that is based on emotion. It is not driven by feelings. We don't do things because of feelings are telling us or leading us to do things. That's, that's not what this love, it can have feelings as a part of it, but it's, it's, not, it's not driven by feelings. It's driven by commitment. It's driven by devotion, unconditional, you know, commitment at that. And, and the word sacrificial has got to factor into it as well because this kind of love is sacrificial. It is others-oriented. Okay, so I just gave you a crash course reminder of what we talked about last Sunday. And you remember, I told you last Sunday, that was only the first half of the sermon. That's why that sermon was so short last week. Some of you are laughing, you don't even remember how long it was. 
You know the track record, right? All right. This is how we have come to know love, agape love. He laid down his life for us. And the point that I made last Sunday was, was that the clearest demonstration of agape love that this world has ever seen is Jesus coming and taking on human flesh and willingly, voluntarily allowing himself to be nailed to your cross. And by so doing, he released you from your sins and the punishment of your sin. To use a different word than release, he made it possible for you to be forgiven of your sins. The clearest demonstration of agape love. This is how we know we've come to know what real love, true love is. He laid down his life for us. All right, so that's what we talked about last week. But I got a level with you. That's not the entire verse. You look down at the reference down in the corner, and it says 16a. That means just the first half of the verse is on the screen. So let's put the other half of the verse on the screen. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. Now you're getting the fuller thought of what John is saying. John is the last surviving apostle. This is the tail end of the first century. It was nearly 60 years earlier that Jesus was crucified. All the other disciples, apostles, they've all died off. And he's trying to explain something before he too is going to die off. And he explains, this is how we've come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for others. We have received this love. Now we are in turn to turn around and we're to share it with others. This kind of love belongs in our lives. It's not just something we are to be on the receiving end on, but now it is we are to be on the end where it is channeled through us into the lives of others, touching other people's lives. This isn't a new teaching, certainly. It's not a new thought, but it's certainly an important one. Basically, it's saying that this agape love becomes a part of how we in turn interact with other people. John was just passing on what he remembers Jesus teaching on some 60 years earlier. For example, in John chapter 13, you remember the account there? The last full day of Jesus' life. It is in the evening, and they're meeting in the upper room, and they're going to have the last supper together. And the scripture specifically starts out in John chapter 13, verse 1, by saying that uh, um, everybody reclined at the table, and, and they're getting ready to eat. And then Jesus loved his disciples, the word agape. That's the word. And he showed him the full extent of his love. And then the account continues with verse 2 and following by saying he got up from the table, he took off his outer garment and set it aside. He took a basin of water and a towel and he went around the room one by one and he washed their feet. And that even includes Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him. Later that evening. And after he finished all of that, he put the basin down and he picked up his robe, put it back on, and he took his place at the table again. All eyes were fixed on Jesus. What's Jesus going to say? He's certainly gotten everybody's attention by his actions. And part of what Jesus said at that moment were these words. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Now, what had Jesus just done? You say, well, he washed their feet. No, what had Jesus just done? He had shown an expression of his love for his disciples. That's what he had just done by meeting a very basic need they had. And now he's saying, guys, if you see me doing that, you should be doing this with one another. You see, it's the same concept. Same 
concept being made. In fact, later in that evening, he went as far as to say this, and this because starts becoming crystal clear what his intention is and what he's trying to teach them. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, that's agape, if you have love for one another. You see, Jesus was making it crystal clear to them that this ought to be what Christians are, are known for more than anything else. We are not primarily to be known for the type of printed T-shirts that we wear. I mean, you can wear what T-shirts you want to wear, but that's not how we're to be primarily known as Christians, followers of Jesus. We're not to be primarily known for what radio station most of us tune into. We're not to be primarily known for what we stand against in society. We're not to be primarily known for what kind of votes we cast when we, when we go to the voting booth on the day of an election. what we are to primarily be known for, what is to permeate our lives to such an extent that it ends up being a dead giveaway to anyone who's paying attention and looking at us is that she's a Christian. It's her love for others. He's a Christian because of the demonstration of their love. That is what we are to be known for more than anything else. It is to be built into, as believers, as followers of Jesus, it is something that is to be built into our very DNA. Now, unfortunately, you know as well as I do that that's not always the case of what Christians and what churches are known for. A number of us in this room have been around the block a time or two. Or as Ben Miller always says, this isn't our first rodeo. Okay. And some of us have been around long enough and we've been in churches enough over the years that we know full well that sometimes the things that churches are known for is fighting and bickering, division, church splits, power struggles, and stuff like that. Now, how sad is that? How much that must grieve the heart of our Lord. What we are to be known for is our love that we radiate agape love. We have been on the receiving end of agape love from God, and that's what we talked about last week. But now, what we're talking about this week is that in turn, that is to radiate from us in touch and touch the lives of others around us. That is what we are to be known for, is our love. So you got to ask the question, what if there's little of none of this in our lives? If this love isn't there, what then? I mean, that's the million-dollar question in all of this. I mean, if, if what we were looking at in that verse a moment ago, 1 John 3, 16, this is how we've come to know what love is. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. Okay? All right. There it is. This love, it ought to be radiating from our lives. It came to us from God, and it's going forth from us. But what if it's not? What if there aren't any demonstrations of love? Remember, I said it's not a feeling. When we talk about agape, we're not primarily talking about a feeling. Not that agape never has feelings, but it's not driven and it's not based on feelings. And so don't just start stop going and thinking that, yeah, but when we were singing that one song, I got goosebumps. I had that feeling, so I know everything's good to go. This love is not a feeling, not first and foremost. It's actually an action. It's something you do. So what if it's not there? Well, let's continue his thought. There's a reason why we're going to have a bunch of PowerPoint today. I'm going to show you the context. Let's go on. Next, very next verse. It says, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? 
That's agape love. How can agape love reside in him? What John is basically saying there is that if, if we're going to ignore needs that surface around us, if we're just going to turn a blind eye to it and just ignore it and not do anything about it, then John says that begs the question, does God's love really reside in us? He says you've got to ask yourself that question. But he's not done with the thought here. He continues on and he says this in verses 18 to 19. Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. This is how we will know we belong to the truth. A lot of what John is writing in 1 John, he's writing about how we can have assurance in our faith. We can have assurance of knowing that we are in a relationship with the Lord that's going to transcend this life into the next life. And that's why he uses the word no, it's a key word that is found throughout the five chapters of 1 John. And he says, this is how we know we belong to the truth, meaning the gospel, the true story of Jesus and salvation that is possible through Christ. This is how we know that we belong to him, is that we're not just talking the talk, we're walking the talk. That's what that first part of that verse is saying. We must not... Love with word. That means we don't just claim it. We don't just say it. Anybody can do that. Talk is cheap. We don't just talk the talk. We're walking the talk. It's being demonstrated in our lives. That's the point he's making. And that is how we can know that we belong to the truth. Just a few verses later, verse 23. He said, now this is his command, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. Observation. He says, this is his command. He doesn't say, these are his commands that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and, second command, that we love one another as he's commanded us. No, I looked at it in the Greek. It says, this is the command, his command. It says it in singular. What is the command? That we believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love one another as he commanded us. So many times in the way that we look at things, we have this tendency to dissect and to separate thoughts, and, and, all, and we do that. We take liberty in doing that sometimes that the Bible doesn't. And this is one of those case in points. That the command that's been given to us is that we believe in Jesus and love one another as he commanded. That's the command that we've been given. Don't separate the two. They go together. Still not clear? John anticipated some. It wouldn't be clear for them yet. And that's why chapter 4. That's why he continues on the thought, because it's like, all right, there's some more I want to say about this to drive it home. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says this, Beloved, let us love one another. That's agape again. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Not knows about God, knows God. We're talking about a relationship here. Everyone who loves is born of God and is in a relationship with God, knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Wow. I want to let that last sentence settle a little bit on your mind. Because this is one of those passages of Scripture that, I mean, you read it and... When you really look at it, what it is saying is one of those statements that makes you swallow hard. The one who does not love, does not agape love, doesn't know God, for God is love. That, what a strong statement. 
And then the two verses that follow that are last Sunday's memory verses. And hopefully you memorized these last week. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God. We didn't initiate this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And I talked about the word propitiation. That basically what that word communicates is that Jesus, Jesus, by coming into this world, taking on human flesh, voluntarily taking our cross and allowing himself to be crucified, by so doing, he was redirecting God's wrath as punishment against our sins. He was redirecting God's wrath off of us and on to Jesus when he died on the cross. That's what propitiation means. That's why I said that's the clearest demonstration of love this world has ever seen. The chapter doesn't end there. He continues. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There it is again. It just keeps coming back up. And this is this week's memory verse. If God agape us like this, we also ought to agape one another. Yeah. We need to be doing this too. And then he says, no one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he's given us of his spirit. See, here's another one of those statements. We know. By this, we know that we abide in him. It's because his love is being perfected in us. That he has loved us and we are loving others. This is how we know that God abides in us and we're abiding in God. And then it goes on and says, because he's given us his spirit. He brings up the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit a moment. When did you receive the Holy Spirit in your life? What does the Bible teach? We received the Holy Spirit at the time of our conversion. There's an obvious case that could be built on that, but that's what the Bible teaches. We receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of our conversion. And what does the Holy Spirit do when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life? Now, that's a sermon in and of itself because, you know, you can easily list off seven or eight things the Holy Spirit does. But what are among the two most primary things the Holy Spirit does when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life? One most important of all, the work of regeneration. That means new birth, a brand new start in Christ. You cannot be born again apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings about new birth. Okay, So at the time of your conversion, you become a new creation in Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. A brand new start. All things are new. Secondly, the role and responsibility of the Holy Spirit is what? To produce maturity in your life. To help you grow in your faith. To say it another way, to help you become Christ-like. That's what the Holy Spirit does. How many of you are familiar with the passage that talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit? The fruit of the Holy Spirit, that passage is Matthew chapter 5, or not Matthew, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And basically what that passage of Scripture is saying is that we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We need to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because when we're cooperating and keeping in step with the Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit is going to be developed in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What's the first thing listed in that list? It's the word love. What Greek word is that? That's the word agape. You see, part of us conforming to the likeness of Jesus, part of us growing and maturing in Christ, evidence of the Holy Spirit being active in our life, is we become more loving. 
with true love, not some cheap imitation of this world's love, but true love, God's style of love. That is evidence that the Spirit of God is active and working in our lives. Now, what if? We're back to the million-dollar question. What if agape isn't developing in your life? What if you're not becoming more loving? What if there is no evidence of you being others-oriented and reaching out and helping people that are in need and are in the middle of struggles and stuff like that? It doesn't cause you to do anything when you see that sort of stuff. What if agape love isn't being developed in your life? you got to ask yourself, why is that? And there really aren't a whole lot of options in answering that question. I mean, one obvious option is the Holy Spirit isn't in your life. And wow, that's a pretty significant problem. Because if the Holy Spirit isn't in your life, then you haven't been born again. you got to go back and revisit that assumption that somehow you're operating under. Okay, and do something about that. So either the Holy Spirit isn't in your life or you're suppressing the Holy Spirit. And there's a problem there that you got to deal with. There's some repentance of some type that needs to go on in your life. Because when the Holy Spirit is at work in a believer's life and we are cooperating, keeping in step with the Spirit, one of the side effects... I use that loosely. One of the side effects is we become more loving of others. Besides the fact we have this overall sense of well-being and peace and we become more joyful and we're more patient than we were and we're exercising more self-control in our life. See, those are all evidences of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. But love is the leader of the pack there. It needs to be happening. It needs to be evident. I don't think it's possible to, for us to overemphasize this that we're talking about here today. I think it's of critical importance. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment of all commands were, you know, we sang a song about this just a little while ago. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command of all command? Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, you know, and strength. It adds strength in one of the the parallel accounts of the Gospels. This is the first and greatest command. Jesus was only asked, what's the greatest command? But Jesus' answer was, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the greatest command. And the second is like it. He doesn't want to divorce this thought. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because when you're doing the greatest command, the second command immediately is becoming evident and follows it in your life. You see, that was his thinking. And that's what he wanted this guy to understand. Now, there's one more thing I want to say before we wrap up. This love that is to characterize our lives is to be in a continual state of growth. It is to be continually growing, continually increasing, this love, agape love. I mean, there's so many passages of Scripture that talk about it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, he says, this is my prayer for you, that your love, and that's agape, will grow more and more. It should be continuing to increase. Or you look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says, may the Lord make your love for one another and for all the people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. See, that's the picture. That's the concept, is that agape love should be ever increasing in your life. There should be none of us that ever come to some kind of a conclusion that I'm already doing enough. I already have enough of this love in my life. I'm already agapeing others plenty. Because when you draw that conclusion, that is one and the same as you saying that, you know, I'm I'm Christ-like. I mean, I've basically reached the level of Jesushood. I'm the love Jesus had. I've got that love now. I'm 
I'm Christ-like, so you know, I don't need to increase this anymore. Now, I don't know who wants to stand up and make that kind of a statement because if it's based on who's standing right now, quick, I'm going to sit, you know. I don't have any business standing, and the fact is none of us have any business standing because none of us are Christ-like to that point. But that's the whole thing. It's ever-growing, increasing, because that attribute of Christ becomes our attribute, and it continues to grow more and more as the weeks, as the months, as the years go by in our Christian walk. So that's why, that's why, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? It's not totally a subjective test. There are some things you can specifically look for to know that Christ is in you. And to know that your faith is a genuine faith. Agape love is proof positive that the Holy Spirit is doing a good work in our lives. The presence of agape love, the presence serves as evidence that you, you really do have a relationship with the Lord. But if there's no evidence that it's in your life, you can't be drawing those kinds of conclusions. You see, it's not a matter, and I say this while our ushers are going to be preparing for communion, it's not a matter of earning your way to heaven. It's not a matter of you receiving eternal life on the basis of your performance and your good deeds. That's not the issue at all. It's all a matter of faith. It's all a matter of you placing your trust in the Lord and loving God with your whole body, mind, and strength. But when that happens, genuine faith clearly demonstrates itself. Because the love you have received from God, does, you don't just receive it and it ends there. You receive it and it flows from you. And that's where you start seeing the evidence that you're in a healthy relationship with the Lord. So during this time of communion, I want to encourage you Maybe look at the front page of your outline again and test yourself, examine yourself, pray over some of those answers and ask the Lord to open your eyes to see what he sees so that you can actually be on the road of a healthy, vibrant relationship with the Lord which is clearly evidenced by your love for others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for the opportunity to, to create some clarity in our minds regarding a subject that obviously is of great importance. It was something Jesus taught extensively about on that final full day of his life. It was something that John, the last surviving apostle, at the very tail end of his life, basically allowed to become, for the most part, the theme of one of his last letters that he wrote. It was so important. Lord, help us to take it to heart and help us through the help of your spirit to see what you see in our lives. Father, your love is incredible. We talked about that last Sunday. But Father, we want that love to be evident in the way we live our life. We want that love to be touching the lives of others through us. And that's what we today is all about. And so Father, that is our prayer. Use us to touch the world with your love. 